Welcome everyone, those of you that are joining us, and I'm sure that there will be a few more joining us as the call progresses. My name's John, I think I know most of you, yes, and it's, it's wonderful to have today what ended up being the fourth in a three-part series, <laughs> a courageous conversation on hope in a time of collapse. But this is the final installment of the conversation under this particular topic. Of course, we're always open to hearing suggestions and volunteers for future conversations. Maybe just a brief reminder, the Courageous Conversation format is very open. The idea is that we have one or two or three people who starts off in a kind of conversation format, sharing amongst each other. And then we turn that into a smaller group conversation and then we follow that with a an open conversation in plenary so it's typically an, an hour to an hour and a half and uh, of course the conversation starters which today will be our hosts until now which is Chris Taylor and Lana Jelenjev they will stimulate the conversation with their kind of experience and learning this is not a place where you will necessarily find the answers to very particular technical questions about sustainability or responsible leadership. This is a more philosophical and open inquiry. And, uh, and it's been, it's actually been quite, quite stimulating. If you haven't seen or participated in any of the previous meetings, you're welcome to go and view those on YouTube. We had a conversation with Skeena Rathal, founding member of Extinction Rebellion. That was followed by a conversation with Michelle Holliday, author and practitioner uh, uh, focused on thriveability. And that, of course, was at the we level, organizational level. And then today is more focused on the individual. And so that's going to be kicked off by Chris and Lana. So I think without any further ado, uh, you're all very welcome. Handing over to Chris and Lana. Thanks. Thanks, John. I thought I'd start us off with a poem because we've done that a little bit in the past as a way of easing us into the topic. And then Lana and I were going to walk together through a conversation. But the poem I've chosen is by Mary Oliver, who a lot of you will know, especially those who have any US connections. And it's called The Journey. And it goes like this One day you finally knew what you had to do and began. Though the voices around you kept shouting their bad ad advice, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles, mend my life, each voice cried, but you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do, though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible. It was already late enough and a wild night and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds and there was a new voice which you slowly recognised as your own that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do determined to save the only life you could save. So I picked that because it brings us, I think, to the I. So th this being the third of the conversations, we've looked at this topic of hope in a time of collapse through the lens of the kind of the system and then the lens of the organization. And then today, looking at it through the I, and I was trying to find a kind of a topic, a title for the session. And it's something like, I think, who am I in this change? Yeah, who am I? As the world kind of heads inexorably towards turmoil <laughs> and complexity and uncertainty. Who do I want to be in that? And that's what Lana and I were going to walk through. And we've got three questions that we were going to talk to each other about. And then the idea is that we then 
move off into breakout rooms and we all walk through those same three questions. So we can dive in. So Lana, welcome. Mm -hmm. Good to see you Good again. You. Thank uh, you. It's great to be here again. And thank you for that time, Chris. It was really heartfelt. And uh, yeah, yeah the, the perfect words to start us off in this conversation. Yeah, she has such a simple yet powerful style, I think. So the first question, which I, I, actually I'm going to confess that these are questions that Lana suggested. And I was like, oh, yeah, I love those. So credit where it's due. Lana's questions. The first question that we felt is at the core of all of this is what am I being called to? So what am I being called to do or to be or to say as the world around us moves towards potential collapse of kind of everything that we've known and everything we've relied upon? What am I being called to do? So what... Do you have a kind of a sense of this for yourself <laughs> that you can give us a glimpse oh, into? Oh, goodness. I think for the past what, the past five, six years is something that that's a crucial question that I have been asking myself on a regular basis. Lately, the answers to, to that question, I would say, is all around healing. You know, how can I bring in more healing in the spaces that I inhabit. And by healing, it's really restoration and the re restorative practices, getting into, yeah, intergenerational and you know, intergenerational wounds as well. So there's this decolonizing my practices. Is oh, we've lost your sound. Oh, oh, and we've gained another participant. <laughs> Let me see. Can you oh, you're back. You're back now. Yeah. So he healing and intergenerational wounds and decolonization. Yeah, decolonization right. is something that I would say has really touched me deeply for the past two years, especially as I started going into healing histories as a practice. And there's a question around me of, yeah, who am I if I decolonize? my perspective, my framing, especially since I'm a Filipina. And for those who do not know my, my country's history, we've been colonized for 333 years by Spanish rule. And then I would say about 50 years for the Americans and a few more years with the Japanese during World War II. So there has really been deep history around colonization in, yeah, from where I come from, the culture that I come from. So for me, as I start to unpack how I view the world, how I see the world, I, yeah, I get to ask myself, okay, is this, is this a point of view from, a, a, from my colonizers? Are these practices or patterns, especially around productivity, uh, are this really mine? Or is this really from my culture? Or is this something that was imposed on us? because of part of slavery and part of yeah oppressing people so quite a lot of things to, to think about and unpack only just with that thought of how can I decolonize my practices mm. and I just want to acknowledge as we go into this conversation that even like rehearsing the conversation could be a kind of like a, a re-traumatizing experience so I just want to thank you for raising it and just be a little bit sensitive to that as we go. But it does strike me that it's a kind of, it's an incredibly generous proposition to be thinking about healing uh, and to be placing that at the centre of your practice when you have been, you and your people have been on the receiving end of so much kind of brutality through colonization. So I just kind of, yeah, I just want to acknowledge that as well, the kind of the generosity that I hear in that. Thank you. Thank you for surfacing that, Chris. And one of the things that, that I also realize is actually we're at the same side 
just from two different sides of the point, you know, like in the way that our, our history, our practices have been altered because of colonization, it's the same with white colored bodies have been altered by colonization. So I see this as it's a healing that needs to happen for, for everyone. So in essence, your liberation and your healing is my liberation and my healing. And the same goes for me. My healing and my liberation is your healing and your liberation. So there's this symb symbiosis, symbiotic relationship to healing that, that happens for everyone. And I definitely recognize that in the issue of productivity that you've that you raised, because I, I feel like I know it's the Protestant work ethic that was instilled in me as a, I think as a child, a, about kind of productivity and efficiency and always being active, always being productive, always doing something and not wasting any time. That was instilled in me really strongly as a child. And I don't even know where from, because I don't recognise it from my parents in particular, but it, it was still there. And I feel like, that is the very ethos that is destroying the planet. That, that is the ethos that is driving us towards collapse. And so, like, decolonizing my own, it's not just my mind, that is in my body. <laughs> it's kind of, it has become part of my body that I can't sit still. <laughs> oh, yeah. and it's kind of like decolonizing that feels to me like it's my part of the side of the coin it is part of my how do I disentangle myself from the paradigm from the ethos that is destroying the planet mm. you know yeah and, and that puts us that that this is also within our agency to choose how we yeah, how we respond to things, how we put different framing to things, uh, especially with this productivity. You're, you're spot on, Chris, around, around productivity, because if I remember it in, in what's this, a couple of months ago, I started really looking into, okay, what was the perception from the Spanish uh, about Filipinos? And we were really called lazy people, there, there were books written about how they, how they found this group of people who are considered to be lazy. But the thing was the context of how it was put. Like in the Philippines, farmers would start planting early in the morning because the late afternoon sun is just too much. So by 10 o'clock, you're not doing anything because you've started, you've started working at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. And the context into which yeah, they were Filipinos were seen as lazy is because of that. Oh, 10 o'clock, you're not doing anything anymore. And that goes on from 10 up until 3 in the afternoon where the sun is still full mm -hmm. on. And then that's when you can say 4 o'clock, things just start to move again. But then, of course, that's dinner time and you know, preparation to the, to, to the evening. I, I see this. There's so many contexts related practices that were viewed differently because it was not oh this is not your practice so for me disentangling that also of oh how did these perceptions come about where did they come from was also healing for me because then I was just like ah okay it's a matter of looking at different contexts and how we are open to to different contexts another point around around productivity is for the Philippine scenario, we've always been told that, yeah, the only way for you to move up the ranks or for the only way for you to move outside of your financial status is to work hard. So working hard became synonymous with financial movement in the family. So it's not just about you, but also within the family. So it was really drilled hard on you have to work, you have to, what's this? You have to just do the best that you can so that you move further along financially as a family unit. And I realized for firsthand how, how difficult that is also 
given that I moved here now in the Netherlands and I've been living here for 15 years. And I saw Filipinas who, when we were in the Philippines, really driven, career oriented. And when they came in the Netherlands, they've suffered depression and they've suffered burnout because that's the only time that their bodies felt like they can let go of things. And it hit me as to how much the part that we say, oh, we're very resilient. We just keep on trudging through things. But actually, there's a difference between resilience and between really hustling to the point that it's not good for your well-being. And this is also what we're doing with the, with the planet. <laughs> we're over-exploiting resources mm. to the point that, yeah, th- that it's, it's not restorative anymore. So this is also why for me, healing is very crucial because if we cannot for ourselves perform restorative practices, how can we do that for others? How can we do that for our work? How can we do that for our communities? How can we do that for the world? Mm -hmm. So we really need to, within each one of us, we need to find ways in which we can restore ourselves. So I'm hearing something about the kind of the congruence between the world we want to create and our kind of mindset and paradigm and also about the way we relate to ourselves and our own bodies and our own lives, the kind of the drivers that we allow to shape our lives. So the congruence of of all of that somehow. I'm I'm curious now for you, Chris, what are you being called to? Uh, What am I being called to? I, yeah, thank you. Uh, there's definitely, I definitely resonate with, with the, with the notion of healing. I don't think I ever quite call it that. For me, it's, there are things about reconciliation and there are things about almost like reparations. So I, I'm very conscious of having come from a white European background, my family being settlers in America from the 1600s, so very early settlers. So my family lineage being part of that set, settler lineage in, in the United States. And I'm very conscious that there's a kind of, that there's some reconciliation needed to, to close that circle. I'm very conscious of being raised as a Christian, a Quaker, but a, a Christian and very conscious of the the damage that has been done in the name of Christianity throughout the world and how closely linked that was to colonialism and how, I guess the thing I just want to name that maybe we haven't quite explicitly said, but how that process of colonialism has carried on post-independence it, 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 in the way that we're still kind of neo-colonizing the world, that it's still shaping relationships and it's still the same forces that are driving the destruction of the planet, that are the same forces that were started during colonialism. So it feels really important to me to, to find the ways to just stop that cycle repeating itself in my life and in my family and in moving upwards from that to, to the global system. So how do we... How do we bring reconciliation to those colonial wounds that we've had throughout hundreds of years? And how do we make reparation for that? So that is definitely a thing. And also, I know that what I'm, re- what I'm also being called to is to work with young people. So I just know that like where I get my joy from is working with young people. So either in a university setting or outside of a university setting, when I can work with young people on these kinds of issues, on issues of sustainability, I just, it fills me with joy <laughs> because I feel like I'm doing something that they get something from and they give me this sense of hope and openness and possibility and they're not as jaded as I found myself becoming (laughs) they kind of they're more up for 
making a change in the world and making a change in themselves. I'm finding young people at the minute incredibly reflective about what they need to do, what they want to be doing in their own lives. Yeah, so those I think are the two threads for me. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more around young people being beacons of hope in this time of collapse. Let's move on to the second question then, which you, which you touched on really. And uh, this, the, the second question we've framed as how do I stay resourced? So if we imagine ourselves doing those things that we're called to in a very turbulent, ever-changing world, how do we stay? And originally we were looking at the word resilient. We were, how do I stay resilient? And then you said the word resourced. Really liked it because it felt to me like it combined both what do I do, but what do I what do I get from outside that is resourcing me as well. So it's I find the, this notion of resilience being a personal responsibility. I find it a little bit troubling. <laughs> so a word like resource that allows me to think about what do I do, what skills and strengths do I have, but also what do I take in that helps me to be resourced? I find it, it, it felt, it opened the conversation a little bit. Yeah. So how are you staying resourced at the minute yeah, as everything is shifting? But when you were discussing that the reason why I shared you know, this idea of resource, it is mainly because from my, from my own perspective and my own lived experiences, the times when I felt like, oh, throwing the towel and say, that's it. I'm done. I don't want to do this work. This is just too much, too big a problem to solve and too much to carry. The practices that has really helped me is to have people around me who can hold the space for me. So really connecting with people who have the capacity to hear and listen to me rant and rave about the problems of the world and at the same time also be able to really listen not give oh this is what you have to do not give advice but to really just hold space and that holding space has helped me tremendously in also listening to myself hearing hearing what I'm saying hearing the narratives that are forming in my lips and at the same time, it also gave me ways to, yeah, to see things differently. So for me, my circles of connection, my circles of relationship are very important for me and nurturing them and making them intentionally designing ways in which I can nurture them has been a big part of my practice. Yeah. And, and to you, Chris, how do you nurture yourself? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it, it's yeah it's interesting so uh, when the pandemic started and we went into lockdown I kind of I asked myself what, what what can I do for anybody else and the thing that I felt like I could easily do that would really help other people was to start a daily Tai Chi practice first thing in the morning so I live in a on a farm with 20 other households and I thought I can just go out and we can stand six feet apart so we, we can be COVID safe but just this kind of going through qigong exercises that help your breathing they help your immune system they calm your central nervous system maybe that's something I can do for other people and I found that it really helped me as well it really helped me through this sense of turbulence that I had as the same thing happening every day. It became a kind of a touch point. And it felt like I was giving something to other people, but I was receiving something as well. So that something like that, where it, there's a kind of a two way thing yeah. definitely makes me feel resourced. And like you, it's connect, it's connection. These people who I live with are a great, they feel like a great support to me. Uh, and I feel like that could go on. And it doesn't matter quite how turbulent the world gets. I've got 
community around me, a local community around me, that we could really support each other. Yeah. Um, and you've hit it. You hit it on the nail, Chris. If we think about how do we resource ourselves, it's really leaning into community. Um, as contrary to, the, to that idea of, oh, we, we tend to tend ourselves. No, it's we tend ourselves in community with others. Yeah. And, and that reciprocity allows us to really feel nurtured and resourced. Yeah. And I just want to link that back to the decolonization piece, because I think another part of the paradigm that is destroying the planet is that kind of excessive individualism that you you have individual freedom and you can do whatever you like but also therefore resilience and looking after yourself becomes an individual activity and that just feels like it cuts you off from mm. community nature a whole bunch of other things that naturally resource you so there's something about for me anyway it feels like decolonizing that sense of individualism is part of the process as well and this is also why i don't use maslow's theory anymore okay of sex self-actualization mm -hmm. yeah. mainly because there has been yeah articles written around it that is it has been appropriated from blackfoot nations wherein it's not actually stopping at self-actualization it's just like self-actualization and after it is community actualization mm -hmm. and that's the part that was not a, not, not properly introduced in Maslow's model so for me it's also part of decolonizing that is also looking at the framings in which we hold like inner inner development or personal development mm -hmm. how are these theories or perspectives framed and in which in which context were they written? So, so for me, yeah, when I read about that, I was just like, oh, yeah, no wonder. <laughs> no wonder we got so much into self-actualization, individualism, because it was considered to be a pinnacle of what it means to be a whole human. And now that we're seeing that, oh, wait a minute, that there was a crucial piece of that was left out, it then unfolds why community is important why doing things together with mm. others is important wow i didn't know that thank you so we're just gonna let's just touch on the third question and then we can head into breakout grooms uh, grooms rooms <laughs> breakout rooms so <laughs> the third question what now mm. so simply that kind of given all of that given everything we've spoken about what now so I recently was part of a leadership gathering and a big part of what I learned from the experience of that leadership gathering is it's very important to meet people where they're at. And also we were talking about the two loops model of how do we hospice people, um, especially destabilizers as, as systems are dying. And then how do we, how are we build bridge bridging people to go from the old to what is emerging. So this bridge building role for me initially was just like, okay, in certain situations to make it safer for me to be able to, to get into conversations around race, colonialism, to be safe. The invitation is if I can bring in people that are say three steps behind me, then it makes it safer. It makes the container in which I can show up, in which I can, yeah, do things will be a safer space for me. Yet, what I also realize is for us to really do the work as leaders, for us to really do the work as, yeah, as individuals, is to also say, okay, there might be people that are not three steps behind us. So what now? How do we reach them? In what capacities do I have to be able to say, okay, I can open myself to having those conversations with them or sharing them my ideas. So that was my experience in this leadership gathering because for me, I realized that we still don't have a shared language, which is what these two loops were showing us. When you're creating an emerging system, we have new language that's forming, new practices that we're forming. 
So we're still not yet there. So when we're talking about racism, white supremacy, colonization, some people still have their primitive brain getting triggered by it and feeling, oh, that's not me. Those are probably my ancestors, but I was not part of it. But if we cannot get past that, because we're still trying to unlearn certain practices and certain internalized behaviors, then it's so difficult to bring people. So for me, it's also trying to find ways to meet where people are at. And how about you? What is your what now, Chris? Yeah, I was thinking about that. What now? I think uh, it's been interesting for me living within a community. So within such a close community where we're all farming and growing food together and we're living together. And I found it a a kind of a completely joyous experience for three years. It was like I had a three-year honeymoon period, which was much longer than I thought it was going to be. And then after the third year, I started to, uh, for three years, I, I, I felt like I was learning. And so I didn't have a view about anything. After three years, I started to have a view about things. I started to think it needs to be done this way. It needs to be done that way. And that started to get me a little bit irritated. And so I'm, I think where I am now is finding a way to not be irritated. It's to go back to learning and curiosity while still having a view about how things could be done better and I just feel like that's a bit like a microcosm for the world (laughs) because I definitely have a view about the world and how things could be done better but if but I I just feel like I need to hold that without getting terribly irritated about it because that doesn't do me any good and it doesn't do anybody else any good nobody listens to an irritated person do they (laughs) you know so so there's something in there for me and then I think I'm the other thing I'm doing here is learning the kind of the intricacies of ecological restoration so I'm learning the practicalities of soil health and how to improve soil health how to improve biodiversity. And I'm again, I'm learning that in microcosm here, but I'm doing that very deliberately so I can, because it feels like the answers to the ecological emergency that we're in come from, for me anyway, come from understanding nature better. They come from understanding ecosystems better, how ecosystems work, how different elements unpredictably move other elements how you can do something here that sparks growth across the whole system so learning that in detail feels like it's part of the answer to our dilemma but I don't feel like I'm anywhere near knowing the answer yet so it feels like there's a couple more years left to learn all of that stuff in minute detail yeah so that's my what now Okay, can we turn it over to breakout rooms, John? Yes, absolutely. So if I'll just share on the screen those three questions, just so you can see them, and maybe we can put them in the chat as well. What am I being called to? So it's, this is your chance to share with other people what feels like it's moving you most strongly as things get a little bit unpredictable what is it that's going to be your role in that in the change that we're in at the moment so the invitation is to go deep (laughs) if you want to second question how do i stay resourced internally and externally and then third question what now where does all of that take you so John, and let's try two breakout rooms and see how we get for for a half an hour then, yeah? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Okay. Opening it for a half an hour. See you on the other side.
Okay, <laughs> so let's uh, let's try and go back around those uh, three questions, and then if there's enough time, we can come <laughs> back to that. So I just uh, yeah, just inviting people to share anything that came up in those discussions. Something you said, something you heard other people say that kind of stuck with you. And I guess what I noticed in the discussion is we didn't quite stick to the questions. We did a little bit, but the answers cut across the questions. Mm. And they quite often answered two questions at once. So I don't feel like we have to be rigid about this. But I just, I guess the place to start is it, it, what is calling us at the moment. So what are we, what are we being drawn to? What is motivating us? What is moving our kind of heart and soul at the moment as things are shifting in the world so i'm happy to just put a a few things on the table chris and they are i did raise them in the excuse me break up so i think you're from through the lens of emerald it's a mission driven organization with mission is people ultimately who who buy into the higher meaning of what we're here to do um, and that's all about supporting the research ecosystem to make real world impact in, in simple terms that's the thing that gets us gets me out of bed in the morning what does it mean in context of a, a world in crisis as i said before i try to break that down so that for everything that's going on in the world but I can facilitate change one small step at a time through the leadership and through supporting with resource allowing our people to work in a way that they feel can make a difference and coming back to something that was raised by others the underpinning role of research to drive positive change in the world and take a journey from research to practice which is fundamental to you there might be concepts but the reality is that the world's burning so if you just take that in isolation that's utterly overwhelming but how do we break that down into okay where are the nodes where are the points that we can influence where can we add value to take that journey forward so that's that's i think also synopsis of our grli in a sense it's community it's about support and it's about allowing one another to interpret and move forward through our respective organizations and to share the pain of some of the stuff that's going on right now that there is a a kind of uh, an emotional element to this and a psychological element to this that's my start thank you tony yeah definitely anybody like to riff off of that yes I definitely do because now that I remember that Tony is the directors of Emerald Publishing, I just realized that I I feel so bad for not remember the speaker's name, but yeah, they've really shared their knowledge and their views about how to make research impactful. That's why we invited them to speak at, at in a session um, uh, regarding how to make research, research that has societal impact. And to be frank, faculty members are still trying to write so that they get published in a high ranking journal and not really focusing on how to make their research help the world. is something that we as an institution is struggling with. Thank you. I don't know whether there's a way to carry on that conversation. I don't know if there's anybody who 
feels like they could pick that off up offline. I don't know. Yeah. I can share from mm. my group. It was fascinating to see the again this this expression of what are we called to in different ways. There's from the creation side, from looking at the different levels in which we can create impact to, yeah, to bringing the good in, in what this was from Anders, but he has experienced as many people as possible. So there's finding different strategies and different ways in which we can really show up and serve and, and yeah, be as individuals in this time of yeah, chaos and collapse that, that's really happening. But what was also fascinating in, yeah, in this context is even though there's these different ways, is really getting to to yeah to the tr- true nature of oneself, you know, like really being true to oneself as that point of yeah springboard for other things. Yeah, you know? I love in the context of uh, how to stay resource. Alex- Alexander even said, "Yeah, I stay away from people <laughs> like that boundary setting." Which is true, which is very much necessary, right? If other people get energized by engaging with others, other people might not be. So also finding that both truths exist. So it's not an, an either or, but an end end is what is also fascinating to hear in the conversations. Yeah, I de- definitely recognize that. <laughs> And sometimes I just need to stay away from everybody. And sometimes there are just certain people I need to stay away from. <laughs> yeah. Another reflection on that, Lana, in, in our group, uh, the three of us and you, of course, uh, just realizing how different contexts play in fundamentally. Yeah. To yeah. basically all three questions. Hmm. Yeah, so re- really that, that being true to oneself is also being an understanding of what's the context in which we are in right now. One thing that Claire brought up, I think, seems to keep reappearing now. So it seems to be a very strong red thread going through all. And that is that sense of conflict at multiple levels. And almost everything everyone has said has a source of a conflict, a tension. And I was sharing that in a wonderful book called Lands of Lost Borders, the author spoke to the word crisis and how in Chinese, we know there are two characters, one that is meaning danger, another opportunity. And she claims that opportunity is a wrong translation that it's actually those inflection points, those crucible moments that are the tension that are very pregnant with possibility, but could go one way or another. And it depends on how you notice it. This is my paraphrase of it, how you notice it, how you consciously choose and how you intentionally act. So that, Claire's was to go shopping, but we all, <laughs> we, we all face this. Tony, you're talking about this is a huge problem. I can't do this alone. It is the tension. So what can I do? So at any level, there is this moment where I think there's such energy, that moment of inflection point. My favorite curve in the world is the sigmoid curve, the growth curve. And it's that moment where you're going to start a second curve. How do you know that's it? And why? What puts you over the edge between I should do that and I am doing that? So those moments, I think, are just, they give me energy, but I think there's something to us about conflict and tension that can p- propel us and hopefully all together. Mm-hmm. Perhaps we can connect that between that inflection point and the opportunity for new growth and innovation to the generational piece and the voices of the young coming through. 
So part of our role can be there to help facilitate and support that, open that ground up, because they're the leaders, they're the folk who are going to be, and their kids are going to be facing these challenges well beyond us as well. So how do we, when their aspirations and expectations from society might be different from how the economic environment has been calibrated so far and what needs to happen. We won't sort that amongst ourselves here today, but how do we bring though that, that generational shift and those voices into the debates so that they take that leadership position with the bravery they need to drive the change that perhaps some of us haven't been able to because we're, we're so embedded. And it's certainly from my perspective, turning the mirror on myself, I've taken a career path over several decades to culminate in the CEO of a business. There's going to be a little bit part of me that's proud of that, regardless, uh, on a personal level. So I've got too much skin in the old game, maybe, to create and drive all the change that needs to happen. So others need to take the mantle on for me. And my, part of my role within the organization is to lay that ground and bring those voices through. But perhaps yeah, that's something that did come up towards the end of our, our breakout around, G, again, GRLI's role. And John, I don't know how, whether you have a chapter or an approach to bring those other voices in, the, the younger generation, the students and so forth. Um, oh. I can maybe just briefly respond to that. Firstly, just to say thanks for that very honest reflection, because it's really refreshing to hear someone who is able to hold up a mirror to themselves and then reflect on that in a, in a, in this type of setting, just regarding the voices of the, and the perspectives of the now generation, the generation that is, that is very much in the ascendancy. So we have invited, and we now have on our board, the president, whoever that is, because it changes the whole time of Oikos International. And in fact, we had a number of them on the invite list for today as well, but it appears to be either exam times or break time. So many of the students are not available at the moment, but yes, we are looking at that. And we're also hoping that this Courageous Conversation platform can in due course become a place where we bring in a, not just the next generation, but a more, more diverse group of voices and perspective. So thanks for that. I know Claire and Maxwell, you were, you had your, your microphone unmuted. So I'll go, I'll, I'll wrap up. That's fine. Completely fine. It, it's all, it's yeah. I wanted to say, I just, before we finished, I wanted to say what a huge thank you to the group that I was in. I really loved our conversation and I would have loved the other group as well, but I just, it just was it just sparked all sorts of stuff so thank you very much and one of the things that it sparked was that help that one of our principles john about everything being interconnected everything is connected mm -hmm. and so when chris was talking about the, the the weaving of the questions when i was looking at them i was thinking it doesn't matter where you start actually because each one of those questions is also interconnected and therefore if i answer one i'm also responding to the other so it was almost living living in practice that whole sense of whatever I do has implications and consequences for the greater whole because of that uh, we're all connected and everything is connected so that was what I was taking away from that thank you thank you I'm just conscious of time and we're about done uh, I was uh, listening to you Tony and, and wondering whether the voices of the young whether that's something that emerald might be interested in <laughs> in publishing something on about what are the young where are the young people in all of this kind of sense of turbulence so i i think if there is interest in that i think john maybe we might be able to pull something together or we could at least talk about that through oikos yeah all right we could yeah we could try and pick that up later then okay and then john i think you wanted just to to have a bit of a conversation about where next didn't you before we close yeah uh, you know, so i think maybe just two very brief points from my side i think the first is just to thank chris and lana for helping host this series and for taking the initiative 
to invite the various kind of contributors and for the thoughtful way in which you've held this. So thank you very much, Lana and Chris. I know I speak on behalf of uh, not just the group here, but everyone who's participated in previous conversations. So thank you for that. Of course, we always, it's in the name GRI Initiative. We, I was saying to Chris earlier on, there's always this little tension between taking initiative and doing something new and then verging on being, becoming an institution, becoming programmatic or transactional. So we don't necessarily know where this is going to go, but we're always open to hosting these types of conversations. So if you have any suggestions for either topics or questions or maybe some conversation starters that would perhaps bring a different perspective, please feel free to reach out to me. Let's put something together. Let's, let's, let's continue in this kind of format. It will also be very helpful to have any feedback that you may have on what you've experienced as, as what's essentially an experiment and uh, any feedback on the format, on the content, on the possibilities. Um, yeah, I just wanted to extend that to those who are here and those who are watching the recording. I did have some emails in the meanwhile from people who said that they weren't able to dial in because of various reasons, uh, but we are of course recording and, and there will be more watching. So I think those are the two points from my side. Thank you. In which case, I guess we're just about wrapping up. I feel like I want to give the last word to you, Lana. I'll oh, my goodness. I, I'll just quickly say uh, thanks to everyone who's here and thanks to everyone who dialed in for any of the four conversations. And I've just, I've had a blast. <laughs> it's been great. I just have really enjoyed the, the depth of the conversations, both in the big sessions and in the breakout rooms and the kind of the care that people have exhibited in discussing sensitive things with each other and just to say Lana I just have really enjoyed the conversations with you and just the the bravery and the openness that you've exhibited in discussing kind of such sensitive topics so thank you because i think without that courage it's hard to get into some of these kind of trickier aspects of what we're going through so thank you for stepping up <laughs> mm. thank you thank you for inviting me and it's just oh there's so many things that we can still have conversations around so i'm always open to to say deepening this uh, conversations that we've started and yeah to just wrap us off, I'd want to share again a, a, a piece that I wrote. Not the piece that I read to you, Chris, but this will be something that fits with what we've been talking about for the past conversations. It's called Wayfinding in the Edges. We are in the space where the old doesn't fit, yet the new is yet to emerge. It's still to be reimagined, rediscovered, reclaimed. We are in this time where the old's dominion is slowly fading, in the grasp of old systems, tightly holding on to power, stabilized by their roles, by their mandates, to their clauses, are ushered by walkouts we finding in the edges. Change makers who believe in possibilities, in the future not only for the select few, where the voices of those silenced, marginalized, oppressed, are brought in with care, listened to with compassion, invited to the table. In these trenches we see the hope of humanity unfolding, generations clamoring for change, from the young to the old, from the south to the north, and to the far corners in between. People finding themselves as hospices of the dying systems, caring for the embers with grace, bridge builders extending their hands to those deeply entrenched in their power, one step at a time. And for those of us in the trenches, tasked with morally imagining the unknown, radically trusting of a future ripe with community, with compassion, with belonging, with well-being. The infinite hope moves us forward to new systems, new ways of being, from a space of regeneration, from a space of restoration. For the way to find us, find ourselves in these trenches, is to start the process of healing. And our way finding is through our hearts, mending the past and the present, answering the call for the future, 
and leading us gently back to each other. Thank you. Thank you. So go well, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Lana.